Take your Bible if you would. I'll take mine, you take yours. If you didn't bring one, there's one in the pew in front of you. We're all using the same Bible, so it's all going to say the same thing. And then I'd like to put them up on the screen, but every now and then I'd like to just kind of go off my notes. Go where the Lord leads me. Psalm 68, turn there. That's where we're going to start. We're going to go several other places. Psalm 68. Well, that rain did some good. Amen. In fact, we'll read uh, the greater portion of Psalm 68, not just what I have up on the screen. And notice that I have written up there at the top, chains. I want you to think about that. That's the theme. I want you to think about chains, what they are, what they represent. Psalm 68, verse 1, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melted before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But, verse 3, let the righteous be glad. Somebody say amen to that. And you're not righteous by yourself. You understand that, right? You are righteous because you have been covered in the righteousness that is of Christ alone. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. From me down to the floor, back to the back there, Brother Roy, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are not righteous by our own presence, our own deeds, our own actions. We are righteous because Christ has made us that way. He's covered us and clothed us in righteousness. So let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God, sing praises to His name. Extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Jah, which is a shortened form of Jehovah. And rejoice before Him. Look at verse 5, I like this. A father of the fatherless. To anybody who was, who grew up, either completely without a dad or without a proper dad, you have one now that's better than any of them could be. You have a father now who is better than the, be than the best father in this world. You have one who will love you beyond what a father could love his own children. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows. I love our widows. Amen. Is God in His holy habitation? And if you seek to uh, do anything to the fatherless children or to the widows, God will cut you down bad. Amen. Now verse 6 is what I have up on the screen. God said it the solitary in families. And I had made mention of that last couple Sundays. God said it the solitary in families. God's given His family. That the next part of that verse is, He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I want you to think about the time when you were bound with chains. If you remember that day. Those were not fun days. Mm -mm. We thought they would be. But they weren't. It ended up being absolute pure hell. As much as hell can be on this earth. That's what those chains ended up being. 
And of course, you know that I mean sin. That's what I mean. So he bringeth out those which are bound with chains. My question to you today is, is there anybody left in this world who is still right now bound with chains? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. God has laid it on my heart to try to help them. Um, I'm going to list off here in a little bit from the scriptures. We're going to go to a couple places in the Bible where it gives a list of all these sins that people do. For those of you who don't do any of those things, look up Psalm 73, verse 6. Pride. Pride is a chain worse than drugs. I watched the testimony of a guy that used to be in the mafia. He was he was pretty high up, pretty powerful. Time Magazine had him listed as one of the wealthiest mob bosses, and he was only 35 years old. He was actually above John Gotti. And him and his father, he followed in his father's footsteps. And as mean and as rotten as they were, they stayed away from drugs. They said, drugs are awful. And I'm going, that's a mafia guy who kills people. And he said, I'm not trying to... Glorify the lifestyle, he said, we didn't just go around shooting people like you see in the movies. If we had somebody that did us bad, we shot them. But he said, in my darkest days, I didn't get mixed up in drugs. But I'm telling you, I'd rather be on drugs than be in chains of pride. God gives grace to the humble, but he resisteth the proud. There is nobody, hospitals, if an ambulance brings you to the hospital and the hospital looks at you in the ambulance and says, they're going to die, we're not going to accept them. Do they ever do that? No! No! If you are not breathing, the hospital will still take you in and try to get you to breathe. Sometimes it works. There's nobody too dead that a hospital won't take them and at least try it. But there are people who are too good to go to a hospital. You see what I'm saying? They'll never show up. Because they never, ever admit to the person they need to admit it to most, which is themselves, that there's something wrong. That's why God resists them. But he gives grace to the humble. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. So to those who are too proud to admit when they're wrong... This message is not going to be for you. In fact, it's probably going to irritate you. But to everybody else, I want to send a message that God can do something about it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings on the message. I don't know how to preach it. Except, Lord, to just follow the scriptures. Lay it out the way you've laid it up in my heart. And I pray, dear God, that you'll cause it to make sense in the heart and the minds of this church. Father, I love this church. I don't want to be anywhere else, ever. That's what I asked you for 23 years ago. And you've been faithful to me all those years. And I'm still asking you, Father, to help me serve as best as I can in this place. 
I love this church and I love these people. And I know them. I know some of the chains that they've come out of. But Lord, I'm also not naive. I know that it's very, very possible that there could be somebody sitting in this room right now that is bound up in chains of pride. And more than likely, they'll never repent. More than likely. It'll be a miracle, but Father, I know that you're the miracle God. Lord, if there is someone here today that's bound in chains of pride, I pray, Father, that you do with them exactly what you did with me when I was. I pray that you'd break, humiliate them because that's what it takes. I know this. And Father, for there may be somebody here in this room right now still in a chain of some kind. I'm not naive. I don't know it. But I know the times we live in. So Father, I, I want to help. If there's anybody that wants help, I want to help. Because you have helped me. So Father, bless our church. I pray to your God that you bless the message. That I would be able to speak it. That would honor and please you. And Father, we would follow in the direction that you lead us. I pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Um, I, you don't have to turn there, but I've mentioned this Wednesday night, and I really believe this. When I, when I survey the world that we're living in right now, when I think about the times that we're living in right now, I understand that if there was ever a time, Paul said, in Ephesians 3, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner, I want you to notice what he said, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, not for Jesus. It's not what he, he did not say, I'm a prisoner for Jesus Christ. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It's a different set of chains. These chains he wore gladly. Wherever Christ drug him, that's where he was going. But a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you were. If there was ever, if there was ever a time when God was in, when grace was in huge demand, that time is now. It is now. Grace is, we know what it is. It is the unmerited favor of God. It is God forbearing and long-suffering with a sinner. God offering the gift of His only begotten Son for that sinner's redemption and salvation so that sinner could come out of the sin of his past, be brought into glorious life, and then go on from this life to be with God in the New Jerusalem for all of eternity. That's what God's grace is all about. It is about God reaching down in the hell holes and in the pits of the degraded, the slop of the nastiness of the nastiest, worst sins that you could imagine. It is God taking those people and making them the new creature that He promised in the Scriptures. That's what the dispensation of grace is all about. Grace is our superpower. If ever we had power, the power that we have is grace. Because it's not just the forgiveness of our sins. It is the life that we live. It is God allowing us to have 
a different way of doing things than the stupid way that we spent our years in. Remember those stupid years? If you haven't had them, I'm probably going to irritate you. You're going to have them if you haven't had them yet. Now turn to Luke. Chapter 4. Turn to Luke chapter 4. And a lot, you know me, I got more scripture than I got time. So if you'll give me time, I'll give you scripture. How is that? Is that a fair trade? You give me time, I'll give you scriptures. Luke chapter 4 verse 16. Here is the stated purpose of Jesus Christ. Do you think, and the setting is, he goes to the sin, he's been tempted in the wilderness three times the way you and I are tempted, yet without sin. So he comes out of the wilderness, he's got the power of the Spirit on him, he goes into the synagogue. And it was a tradition, they have, synagogues are full of tradition. They do things the same way every time, they've been doing it that way for thousands of years. You go into the synagogue, you might be the one that they designate that you're going to be given this huge scroll to read the reading, the portion of the scripture. And it's going to be the Old Testament. When I look at this story, I don't think it was an accident that they just happened to hand Jesus, the book of Isaiah, opened to Isaiah, what is it? Isaiah 61, it turns out. I don't think it was an accident that he just happened to hand him this particular passage to read. It was by the ordination of God that Jesus walked into this synagogue on this day and they handed him this portion of scripture to read. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as, and as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And when he had opened, and you, if you'll note, Isaiah has 66 chapters, your Bible has 66 books. So there's that connection there. He's not just reading a small amount of scripture, he's representing the whole of the Bible. The whole purpose of Jesus to come into this world is right here. Right this exact reason is why he came. He didn't come for any other thing. Now he healed people, yes, but he didn't come to necessarily heal people of diseases. He raised dead people back to life, but he didn't necessarily come just to raise dead people back to life. He came to save sinners. That's why he came. So there was delivered unto the book of prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And if you look in Isaiah 61 where he's reading, he actually stopped mid-verse. Cut it off. And he, at this point he closed the book. Gave it back to the minister again and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this script scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness and wondered at, what is that word? The gracious words. You know what that means? The words were a gift of God that nobody deserved, but God gave them to you anyway. The gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? You know, you know what they're saying by that? Is he, isn't he just nobody? Yes. He's just nobody. And yet, God sent him down from heaven. He, see, up in heaven, he's somebody. He comes down here. He does not take the form down here of somebody. He comes down here to take the form of nobody in particular. But he says, I'm here to help. I'm here to take those who are bound in chains. 
And I'm here to make them free from those chains. Now, you've heard me say this hundreds of times. The Bible is not a self-help manual. If you could help yourself, why are you here? That includes me. If you could help yourself, you wouldn't need to come to this meeting today. You could just go and help yourself, and then you wouldn't need all this church stuff. You wouldn't need it. But you cannot, if you lived to be a thousand years old, you could not break your own chains. You tried, didn't you? Didn't you? You tried. And you couldn't do it. So at some point you said, I need help. And I believe that it is the church's responsibility to help. Turn to Galatians 5, very quickly. Galatians 5, very quickly, I said. Not, that means not slowly. So the time that you give me, now you're taking that time. So give me that time. You give me the time, I'll give you the scriptures. Amen? All right. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Here's the chains. Here's the chains. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. You know, I like to say the works of the flesh are obvious. Doesn't take a brain surgeon, doesn't take a rocket scientist, does not take an Albert Einstein to figure this out. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery is a chain. Because people get hooked into it and they can't get out of it. Fornication is a chain. Even amongst married people. Fornication's a chain. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Those are chains. Idolatry. That's covetousness. Covetousness is a chain of bondage. You're wanting everything around you. You want everything you ain't got. Witchcraft is definitely bondage. Hatred is bondage. You're bondage to who you hate. Variance. Emulations, wrath, strife. Wrath is bondage. Wrath is a bondage. Wrath is people who have to beat other people up. Some people just feel the need to beat other people up. That's bondage. Strife. People feel the need to fight all the time. Everything they say, they're trying to stir up an argument, a fight. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness. That's, is that a chain? Is envying a chain? Revelings, the party man, the party gal, is that a chain? Shoot. That's a cover. The party gal is covering up a big empty hole in their life that they think they can fill with parties. Of the which I tell you before as I told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Chains are locked on you automatically at birth. You are born in bondage. Born in bondage. So don't tell me how good you are. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Your chain is probably pride. Who tells me how good they are? Lamentations 3. You can turn there, but I'm going to read it. Lamentations 3, verse 1. I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness and not into light. 
Surely against me he has turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin he hath made old. He hath broken my bones. Who in here has seen pictures that people post on Facebook? A picture of a real pretty young lady who in five years became an old hag because of methamphetamine. You ever seen those pictures? Didn't that make you sick? My flesh and my skin hath he made old, and he hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me, and encompassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places, as they that be dead of old. Do you remember when you were in chains? Were you in darkness or light? He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Chains are meant to be heavy. To my knowledge, they never handcuff somebody in paper. Never handcuff somebody with a piece of toilet paper. Chains are meant to be heavy. There's nothing fun about them. There's nothing light about them. They're chains. And I've just... You know, I'm looking at your face. Looking for signs of chains. Do you have them? Turn to Romans chapter 1. Here's some more. Some of these are going to overlap. I'm, what I'm showing you is the chains. And if you are guilty of any of these, then you're in that chain. You're, that's your bondage. That's your chain. Romans chapter 1 verse 28. You know, I, I just had a thought. I was trying to reconcile this last night and I was tired and it didn't make sense. Because when I was studying chains, I came across that story in the Bible where the man who was possessed of devils, remember him? He had le they called him Legion, for we are many, right? And you remember, they would bind him up in chains, but what would he do with them? He would break them. Now, here's what I think that's a picture of. It's a picture of the world's attempt at driving away or loosing you from the bondage that you're in to sin. But even though the man was able to break the chains that they put on him, he was still in bondage to spirits. Something worse than iron chains is to be full of devils. See, the world, you can get mad at me if you want to. The world does not have the answer to alcoholism. AA, NA, Al Anon is not the answer to these chains. I'm not knocking them, I'm just telling you that you can go to an AA meeting. And successfully stay away from alcohol the rest of your life and die and go to hell. You're still in bondage. And AA did nothing for that. Because it refuses to identify where the real help can come from. My brother-in-law was going to AA and he invited me to an AA Bible study. And I want to tell you, I've never heard a mishmash of religions in one place than at an AA Bible study. It was a mess. And I told my brother-in-law, uh, this is not the place for you. There's only one way out. One real way out. Of chains. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Amen. So what if I were to say to you, I'm going to sell my program to you. My program is this. What if I were to offer you, let's say that you were a drunk. And I'm going to offer you the Bethel program for getting you out of alcoholism. Now it's going to take 60 years or better. I'm not much of a salesman, am I? I'm 
I'm t what I'm telling you is it may take the rest of your life. But at the end of that life, I guarantee you, every chain will be broken. Guaranteed. You say, well, what if I mess up during that time? God's got that in the program too. It's called grace and a rod of correction. He'll deal with it. Has he not? Here's some more for you. Romans 1, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all, number one, in righteousness. I could stop right here. That's it. We're done. You have unrighteousness in you. That's a chain of bondage. Anything you do wrong, you're in bondage to. Um, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Who's guilty so far? Raise your hand. Be honest. Maliciousness. You should have seen me drive yesterday. Lisa said, you're an angry driver. I said, no, I'm a vengeful driver. Because if you dog that fast lane, I'm going to pull around in front of you and stop right in front of you. That's wicked. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Maliciousness. Maliciousness is a chain. You mistreating everybody around you. Either with the back of your hand or your mouth. You're in bondage. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. Is that bondage? You know the person who whispers about everybody else? That's a bondage. See, I know what it is. It's the sin of pride. Because it seeks to reduce everybody else in an effort to raise yourself. That's who backbiters are. And whisperers, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, not having, without natural affection, not having enough love for people. Not, your natural affection is that you love your own kids not to kill them before they're born. That's natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. All of these that I'm reading off to you, they're bondage, they're chains that you're guilty of. You're in them. Mark chapter 7, verse 20. I'm going to move through some of this and get to the message. I ain't got to the message yet. Mark 7, verse 20. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Hey, everybody, look up here. Look up here. Evil thoughts. Your thoughts against somebody else. That's an evil thought. You undressing somebody in your mind that's an evil thought and don't tell me it never happened because I don't believe you I don't believe you all of sin comes short of the glory of God evil thoughts Adulteries, fornication. Have you ever noticed the, the top end of all these lists usually start out with all the nasty stuff? Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness. Fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So we're not talking about change that somebody else put on you. We're talking about the ones that you clapped on yourself. Uh, Colossians 3. Let me read that list. Colossians 3. What I did was I just picked out all the list of bad stuff. Everything we're not supposed to do. 
Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. There he started out again. Same, same head of the list. So let me ask you a question. Is this not a fornicating society we live in? It's everywhere. Including here. In this room. Don't tell me it's not. I don't believe you. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. That means instead of you looking at your wife and saying, she's the prettiest thing I ever laid eyes on. I love being with her. That's ordinate affection. Inordinate affection is anything except your wife. Evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the time ye, in which time ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Anger. Anger is chains of bondage. You're angry all the time. You're never happy about anything. Come out and you come home. Take it out on everybody. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. There are some people who cannot talk, but they F this and S this and D this and GD this and SOB this and every, everything that comes out of their mouth. It's filthy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Some of you, some of you are liars. Some of you are liars. And I would say, more than likely, in this very room. Seeing that you lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Here's the key right here. The key, the successful key to someone's chain is giving them a new man that doesn't do these things. Instead of them trying to reform the old man, that's going to do these things. Does that make sense? Verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God. Holy and beloved bowels of mercies. Kindness, humbleness of mind. Meekness, long suffering. Forbearing one another. and Forgiving one another. This is what I'm getting to. Long suffering with people. Having bowels of mercy. You know that bowels are the seat of your emotions. When you, get, when you get afraid of something, where do you feel it? Your heart and your organs, right here. You feel it right here. Chest pounds, you get sick to your stomach, have to go to the bathroom. That's what he's talking about. And when we really love someone, you know, we, feel, we seem to feel it in our organs, don't we? Bowels of mercy. You love somebody so much and want to help them so bad, you feel it right here. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is the church's real response to those that sin. Not the response... That some people have done in time past in this church. That's the real response. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. For the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, murderers, fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers. Them that defile themselves of mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. These are all the things that we're in bondage to. I still got, a, I still got another list for you. Where is it? I skipped one. Where is it? It's in my notes somewhere. Come on, help me out here. Up. Ah! Turn to, uh, how did I put that in there? Turn to uh, Galatians. Galatians. Turn there. Maybe I did read it. Yeah, I did. Galatians 5. I did read that list. 
Okay, now, done with all that. I'm going to, I'm going to preach the message now. Next Sunday. Turn to Psalm 69, I'll close with this. I'm, I'm just laying the groundwork for you. I got something in my mind. You've figured that out already, haven't you? Psalm 69. Look at verse 33. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Raise your hand if you used to be in prison to something like drugs, alcohol, fornication, something like that. Man. Doesn't it feel good to not be there anymore? I'm going to be honest with you. I, I told you during homecoming back in 2016 my doctor put me on Percocet three times a day you know I thought I won the lottery and then I ended up taking 10 at a time 10 milligrams at a time 100 milligrams Percocet at a time do the math. You're going to run out before they'll let you have more. And I'm telling you, it was torture. Absolute torture. No way in the world I want that back. But I sat for six weeks, three times a week, in a group of men and women who were addicted to drugs, and I listened to them. See, my thing was pain in my back, and when I got the back surgery, didn't need it. But I found out that other people have pain of a different kind. That's why they did what they did. Now we're all sinners, and it's not like the first time you got high, you went, I hate this. This is the awfulest thing in the world. Right? Or the first time you really tied one on. I'll never do this. This is awful. Why do you people do this? You didn't do that. You enjoyed it. First time you slept with somebody illicitly you didn't hate it you didn't go what is this all I hate this Ugh! you didn't do that you wanted more thus the chains of bondage clap down on your soul and I want to help people I want us this church, number one, to help our own. Because there may be somebody in this room now who's in a chain of bondage that we don't know about. Secondly, I want to help everybody out here. So I'm going to pray that God will show us how to do that. Does that sound good? But you've got to get it in your mind that you're not going to be bothered at the worst people in Jefferson County coming in this church. This is a hospital for the sick 
and the dying, not a resort for the self-righteous. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here, and I want us to pray. Because, you know, maybe what I've got in mind to do, maybe not what, I mean, I've been through this before. Had my mind set on doing something, and God said, that was stupid. What was you thinking? So I'm not even going to say yet what's in my mind. But God doesn't despise his prisoners. And if God's not ashamed of them, we're not going to be either. Heavenly Father, the, the people that are in bondage, you know who they are. And you know what that bondage is. And Lord, I know what that bondage is like. And Father, I know, I know that there are some people who really do want help. They just don't know where it is. They don't know where it is. And if they have tried religion, they realized it wasn't there. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you bless the word that's gone out of this place into our hearts, that we first, we as your people, would realize, God, that as long as we abide in this flesh body, there are chains on it. So, Father, we understand that we're not looking for the quick fix. We're just looking for the only fix that there really is. And that is the gospel. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open up your hand and your pillar of cloud, pillar of fire to this church. And that in that, Father, you would guide us to what you want us to do. Father, if it's your idea, you'll bless it. And we won't even need to have to ask anybody for help or anybody for this or anybody that. It'll just be there. And Father, I've known you long enough to know that what you bless, what's your idea, you bless. And it won't even be hard for us to do. It'll be the easiest thing in the world. But Father, I pray, dear God, that you would lead us, though, Because we're going to be messing with the devil's playground. His area is bondage. That's how he works. And he's not going to like if we try to save his prisoners. He's going to fight us. Already has. So Father, we, when whatever we do, we'll need your protection. Or we won't be able to do it. Father, I love sinners. I love sinners. I'll take the weak and the sickly and afflicted every day that you send us one. We'll take them. So help us, dear God, to be the kind of church you want us to be. Help us to be that church. You've led us this far into doing what you've told us to do. Now, Father, we stand ready to find out what's next for us as a church. So we humbly ask your blessings on us as you lead us and guide us. And for those, Father, who are prisoners, still in bondage, give them comfort. Give them comfort that it won't be long until you make them free. It's what we want, Father. It's free. Bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said.